Okay, everybody, welcome back to lesson 18. Um, in this lesson, we're going over the 18th and 19th centuries of art. So um, this is kind of bringing us more to our present day and kind of just building to our last lesson, which is just like our modern day art period. So um, there's lots of like little movements and styles and changes that happen during this time period um, that are good to know. It's good to know like the the movements or like the isms is kind of what I refer to them as. Um, but yeah, just kind of, you know, take everything as it comes. And, um, but just know that there is a lot of change that's happening during this time period. So it might kind of feel like we're going around pretty quickly during this lesson. So let's get started. So um, what we refer to as um, modernism is sort of what starts happening during this time period of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, this is when the modern age is launched by the industrial American and French revolution. So there's a lot of change happening. Um, it's sort of like the modern day Renaissance almost because we have so much change that's occurring during this time period and um, so much development as well. We see this as the time of enlightenment or like the age of reason. Um, we start thinking more on rational and scientific approaches to beliefs um, rather than totally relying on religion, which is what we have done in the past. Um, and most of our artwork has referred to in the past. Um, we also see that traditional sources of patronage are sort of like going away as we see developments of photography and um, video and things like that. The, um, the need for having like your oil portrait painted of your family or of, you know, kings and queens and knights and all of that sort of just, um, it, it sort of withers away. And so um, the need for art really does change as well. And so you can tell that by the different styles and um, just sort of the direction the art's going in entirely. Neoclassism is sort of our first um, little movement that happens before all these other movements start to happen. Um, neoclassism is an emulation of classical Greek and Roman art. So just kind of carried forward to more of our, not modern day, but you know, it, we're in like the late 1700s here. Um, this is an effort to represent non-hereditary government or the Republic. So let's kind of think about what's going on during that time, especially in the United States. Um, we start to see that there is, you know, a lot of war going on, a lot of sort of like rebellion from traditional government. Um, and so our paintings are sort of depicting these um, these stories that have happened in, um, you know, Greek and Roman art um, and just in Greek and Roman times to represent the feeling of that and, you know, kind of how that's carrying over to modern day. So uh, this piece is uh, David, the Oath of the Harati. It's a story of virtue and readiness to die for liberty. Um, there's a very sculptural quality to these figures. We're still re relying a lot on sort of realism and idealism as well. Um, but even though we're we're fighting for liberty and we're, you know, really rebelling from the norm of what like our Eurocentric um, views were or trying to escape that, it still obviously carries over. Um, we still see that there is a, um, a sort of, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? A, uh, there's diversity in how, how women and men are treated during this time period. As we can see here, the women are very overcome and unable to participate. They're, um, still kind of seen as objects during this time. And this reflects the belief of the time that women were unfit for public life and women were banned from the art academy as well. Um, where uncloth models were used. So we still don't see a lot of women in, um, in you know, as painters and as artists during this time period and really doing anything that was a traditional job for a man. We do see um, Angelica Kaufman come from this period, though. She is a neoclassic artist um, who overcame obstacles of women's exclusion from professional art. Now, she did have a lot of privilege. Um, her father was an artist and um, you know, was was higher up in society. So, you know, she kind of had an advantage, had some privilege going on. But still, it's good to just note that there was a woman that was acknowledged in this time and, and in this like, you know, style of art as well. Um, she, she sort of, you know, has the same themes as neoclassism as like referencing Greek and Roman art. Um, however, she has a different vision of what women's capabilities and um, comparison to the Oath of Ferrati. So um, she's showing women as, you know, still in these Greek and Roman times, but doing things that, um, you know, women are not often seen doing, like sketching this, um, this sculpture here and, you know, doing things that are, are more academic and things like that. So 
what about the architecture during this time? So we see a lot of our like our even present day public buildings, the White House, the um, you know, all, all of our buildings that are just like very known throughout our culture and uh, throughout American history being built during the neoclassicism time. Um, this is Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. It's based on the and Andrea P Palladio's reinterpretation of the Roman country style house. And so this style with this like really extreme radical symmetry is being used is often called federal style. Um, it's inspired by the civic virtues of courage and patriotism. So we want a lot of our buildings during this time to have this like sturdiness and seriousness to them um, and symmetry that kind of like, you know, represents it being very stable and strong. Um, and so that's why a lot of our buildings that are built during this time sort of look similar to this one, even, you know, in our hometown or not hometown, but like our, our larger states towns um, where we have, you know, these old historic like courthouses and different historic buildings. A lot of them look like this because a lot of the buildings that are still holding up today are in this style. Um, neoclassical architecture found its way into almost every U.S. city, like it said, like I said. Um, so, you know, even in like Charlotte and, you know, places that are sort of local to us, we might see buildings made in this style that were from around the, you know, late 17, early 1800s. Um, and so that's how you can kind of tell is when they're done in this style, it typically is um, meaning that they are coming from that time period. So our next ism is Romanticism. Romanticism is in reaction to neoclassism. Um, it agrees that neoclassic importance of the individual liberty is important, but um, they kind of they're sort of like the um, like the Baroque of the Renaissance, if that makes sense, where they have a lot more like emotional expression to them, um, more imagination and emotion makes it more valuable than reason does. So um, nature is less, they also believe nature is less corrupt than civilization. And there's a preoccupation with current events. So um, lots of current, you know, present day events that are happening during this time period are depicted in these paintings. Um, we see there's a little bit more abstraction and more sort of like liberty for the artist to, you know, do what it is that they want to do. Um, let me, okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure it was still recording. Sorry. I heard a little noise. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really just kind of like focusing in on um, the emotion and the drama of these different events that are happening to sort of get a reaction out of people, honestly. So in this piece here, Francisca Goya is, is a really like predominant name in Romanticism. Um, they experienced the horrors of Napoleon's occupation. Um, this is called the 3rd of May, 1808. And it is um, a portrait done of um, this firing squad um, lining up these um, people and, you know, attempting to shoot them or, you know, already having shot them. But it's very dramatic, very gruesome. Um, I think an interesting detail here is that um, it depicts the firing squad um, executing the suspects, but they you never see the faces of them. So it sort of dehumanizes the firing squad in a way. Um, while you all you get to see the faces of the suspects and, you know, sort of this pure raw emotion. Um there is a uh, protest going on against the tyrannical governments during this time period. So, um, you know, this kind of like dramatization of um, and theatrics of, of these events is really important to sort of like, you know, strum up morale and, um, you know, get people excited about um, or passionate about this, these events. Um, another romantic artist is J.M.W. Turner. Um, this is the burning of the houses of Lords and Commons. And this captures a disastrous fire that happened in Parliament from only months before um, it was painted. And you see that there's a very loose and expressive brushwork being used here to introduce like more distortions and exaggerations and traits of traditionally abstract artwork. Um, but there is exaggeration happening here. Like the flames, for example, don't go as high as they, they seem like they're being depicted in this piece. Um, Turner also straightened the river to achieve a wide horizon line. So it looks like it goes a lot farther. And um, again, emphasizing the feeling rather than actual geography. Um, we also see during Romanticism, the American landscape painting kind of come to be. Um, Thomas Cole, your, your grandmother or, you know, aunts, uncles, that sort of thing, um, probably have like a Thomas Cole or maybe not all, but <laughs> a lot of them have like a Thomas Cole print in their house that are these just like very beautiful American landscapes. Um, Thomas Cole is sort of like the um, Norman Rockwell of landscapes where Norman Rockwell is sort of like, you know, painting the 
the traditional American family. Thomas Cole is, you know, tr painting the American landscape, which is like, you know, making it look very great and awesome and um, just really beautiful. So this is the Oxbow. It shows a broad panoramic view of this landscape. It's done in Hudson River School style, which just means that they focus on um, broad panoramic views, very carefully rendered detail, especially here in the foreground, and a very light field atmosphere, but very realistic, very, um, very dramatic as far as like color and lighting go, uh, but always very beautiful. Um, this is another American landscape painting. This is Blue Hole in the Little Miami River. It's done by Robert S. Duncanson, um, who was an African-American with an international reputation for doing this type of artwork. Um, he modified precise realism of the Hudson River School style, had a more sort of like original poetic softening is what they like to say. Um, it does feel a lot softer than that this one here um, as far as like the edges go. Um, but very orchestrated light color and detail to it. But it, it almost like there's like, there's a little narrative almost going on in this story. And it feels like there's like a story sort of unfolding. Um, photography and how that sort of, you know, influenced things as well. Cameras free painters from the role of narrator and illustrator. Um, the technology, though, is very cumbersome, toxic, and um, just not very useful in its early phases. It presented a lot of practical challenges in the barren regions of the Western wilderness. Um, but we do see some photographs taken during the, like, you know, the late 1800s, 1871 is when Timothy O'Sullivan creates the um, or takes the Iceberg Canyon. It's very stock, austere, and well-crafted. And the sitter is perfectly positioned on the rocks that you see here. So this is actually a really, really um, impressive photo to have been taken during this time period. Because one thing that you may or may not know about photography in its early stages is that it takes a very, very, very long time to develop. So um, this could have been going on over the course of like hours, honestly, to take this photograph and for there not to be any blurring or anything. Um, realism, which we've talked about realism before, but as far as like a, a, um, an ism, I guess, in this little, um, you know, uh, group of, of isms, um, we see it as being the academic art form, um, tradition minded works that follow formulas laid down by an ac ac academy or a school. Um, the French Academy salon is, is the one that sort of really takes realism and, and goes with it and kind of, you know, creates it as being the norm for, for artwork. Um, the French Academy Salon is an annual exhibition in the 19th century, and only way that an artist might become known in those days is by having their work accepted to the French Academy Salon. Um, but yeah, realism is just, um, it, it's, it, we'll, we'll get into it in the next slide. <laughs> um, realism oftentimes depicts ordinary um, life without idealism and exoticism or nostalgia. Um, it's a reaction to both neoclassism and romanticism. Um, but it, yeah, it's essentially just wanting to highlight um, very average, ordinary scenes in in our life and not try to over, you know, dramatize it or anything like that. This is Gustave Corbett. Um, it's the Stonebreakers. It's just showing these ordinary road workers. There's no dramatization of the struggle. It's just showing it is what it is, essentially. But it's not trying to make it seem like we should feel sorry for these people or that they have a really hard job. It's just painting what it is. Um, there's a lot of accusations towards Corbett. Uh, there is the, a idea that he is raising a cult of ugliness. It's um, thought to be inartistic work or socialistic work. And it led him to set up his own exhibitions that are focusing in his, his content or his subject matter. Um, we also see this oil painting outdoors, or you would call it plain air now. Um, it's first done by Corbett. It's made possible by portable paint tubes, which um, is you know hard to think about. But at one point in time, you had to mix your own pigments and binders together. Just you know, as you're creating your your paintings, it wasn't like you had a paint tube that you could go out to Michaels and buy. Um, but yeah, this this um, plain air is. Um, is the ability to capture first impressions and to make something feel like you're you're there and you're experiencing it in person and it's not like a, a memory or an idea of something. Um, but yeah, so we could say we could say this was this was one of those two. It's he's painting this as especially the landscape as it's unfolding. 
Um, Rosa Bonhair is another realist painter. This is the horse fair is what she titles this work. Um, she specialized in rural scenes, um, that specifically dealt with animals and, um, ha usually has a lot of motion and sort of energy surging throughout her pieces. Um, but this is another one of those realist works where it's, it's highlighting more sort of contemporary life and an average person's, you know, world. Um, and then we have Edward Manet, who, not Monet, but um, Manet, and uh, he is a predecessor of Impressionism. He combined flattened painting in the Japanese style with Corbett's realism, and there's an interest in visuals over content here. Um, this is Luncheon on the Grass, and it is, there is, there is a lot of realism here, but it also kind of feels like these figures here sort of like photoshopped in almost, um, and that's definitely a sign of Impressionism as sort of, um, you know, getting the impression of something, not necessarily having something painted exactly how it's supposed to be, but more so trying to capture a moment or a feeling. Um, but yeah, it, it does kind of feel like this is a little puzzle piece together. And I think this is where impressionism, which we'll talk about a lot later on, um, really, really kind of feeds into the art world and, and becomes really prominent. So sorry, I thought that wasn't going to be on the next slide, but um, or the next PowerPoint. But Impressionism, this group formed after the denial of the 1873 salon, the, the same um, French salon that we talked about earlier. And they um, they organized their own independent exhibition. So um, impressions really just means impressions of what the eye actually sees rather than what the mind interprets. Um, I used to have a video linked here, but I, I may or may not include that. So, um, you know, if it's there in the Edpuzzle folder, watch it. But if not, don't worry about it. Um, this is a painting by a pa painting by um, Claude Monet, not Manet, um, and it is Lagar Saint Lazare. Um, it's the Saint Lazare station. It's just a train station, kind of like you know, um, shelter here. And it focuses on the play of light amid the stream of the locomotive. So um, again, you know, this might not be exactly how you would see in real life the smoke sort of like emitting from the train, but he's wanting to capture the feeling and like almost the texture that it maybe feels like kind of more thick, more um, like, you know, just harder, harder air than the rest of the air that's happening around it. So um, this is definitely done in impressionistic style. It's, it's sort of just the idea of something rather than painting it exactly how it looks. Um, the Impressionist, the term arose from Monet's versions of Impressions Sunrise, which is this piece here. It's initially meant to be derogatory, but a fitting description for the artist. Um, there are small dabs of color that are separate strokes looked when you look at them up close and blended when they get farther away. Um, there is more pure color seen in Impressionist pieces um, that provides for more vibrancy. And um, they're also optimistic about the new technologies within the art world. Um, I think one thing to note here is that Impressionists, they want to give you the feeling of something or how something makes them feel. So this sharp contrast between this orange sun and like this sort of misty blue that goes all around it really it lets you know that Monet has a full understanding of color theory, um, how complementary colors work next to one another and how, you know, having blue next to orange can make the orange really, really pop having this like impasto technique to show where there's areas that feel more thick and more, um, you know, that stand out more than the rest of the spaces. But yeah, this is a really, really beautiful work. And although it's not done in a realistic style, um, this artist has a full understanding of um, the elements and principles of design, color theory, the, their medium of paint. And it's, it's very impressive. So it, it also sort of falls into that rule of like, you know, you have to know the rules to break the rules. And I think that Monet is doing a great job of doing that here. Some more impressionist paintings. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through these quickly. This is a piece by, um, oh gosh, who is it by? Renoir. And um, Renoir is another impressionist painter. This is just, um, this is Les Moulins, De La Galette. Um, which is essentially just a like a square, I guess, or like a, a party kind of happening in, out in the open. And the impressionist qualities is how this light is flickering through onto the figures um, and showing in like this very like gold 
sort of like yellowish color. And then we have sharp contrast between the shadows that are this more blue value um, or bl blue hue rather than the yellow hue. So that a lot of good contrast is happening to achieve this look of like the light flickering in. And that's what they're wanting to capture and, you know, show in this moment is, um, is that light flickering. Um, Mary Cassette is another American Impressionist. She is a Philadelphia-born artist who befriended Manet and Degas, who were two Impressionists in Paris. And she exhibited with the Impressionist groups um, over four times. So her specialty became painting modern women in their own situations. So kind of like Angelica Kaufman in a way, she's she's painting women just in ordinary life setting um, and, and just trying to capture them um you know, existing and doing what, what they do in their daily life, not trying to dramatize it or anything, but just capturing them in their everyday life. Um, this is the boating party and it has a, a very strong connection to um, Japanese prints in a way. Um, it has subtle feminist content to it by the way that we see the woman's face and, you know, her, her expression, but the man is sort of like out of focus here and is facing away. Sculpture um, impressionism doesn't happen a whole lot, but we do have artists like August Roden, who um, is a sculptor and is a contemporary to the Impressionist. He used Michelangelo's unfinished pieces um, as inspiration for his more rough finishes, like we see here. If you've seen a piece by him, it's probably been The Thinker. This is used a lot in like pop culture as well for different things. And um, the media here is of uh, plaster and clay. And you can tell here that this is just more of like a rough cut image and it's trying to capture more of like, you know, just a moment in time rather than it being this big majestic, like, you know, very uh, masculine pose. It's just, it's just sort of more natural, more um, as you would picture someone to be sitting or, you know, to be acting. Post-impressionistic style, um, they did not really share a single style. And I guess you could kind of still say we're, in postmodern or, you know, post-impressionism happens in like the late 1800s and sort of goes on um, throughout the 1900s. There is a lot of um, formal organization pieces that we see by um, Surratt here and who falls into post-impressionism. Uh, it's not an image of a fleeting moment despite its impressionistic qualities, but we start to see the development of new styles like divisionism or um, pointillism is kind of how I've always heard of it, heard of it called um, the optical color mixture is achieved by controlled dots of color and mixed with the eyes. So um, we've talked about this a little bit before in like our color lesson, I believe, but where there's like, you know, one color that's next to another color, it creates an illusion that we like blend it together. So for example, if we're trying to get a green color, one might put a yellow dot and a blue dot next to one another. And when those two combine, they create green. And so, you know, it takes a very, very, very well-trained, um, super knowledgeable, um, artists to be able to achieve a painting like this and to get the color, you know, um, that they actually want to be seen. But you've probably seen this piece before. Very, very impressive piece. Takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of understanding of color theory to, to be able to achieve something like this. Um, more post-impressionism styles. Um, we have personal expression or expressionistic style. There is an emotional intensity that happens through the strong color contrast, the bold brushwork, and the contours. Van Gogh is an expressionist painter. Um, and we can we can tell that by Starry Night, another of his notable pieces, even this piece here. Um, Van Gogh focuses on highly textural brushwork and strong color to express emotions clearly. Um, there's a strong influence of Japanese prints as well in his work. And um, this is his piece here. Um, lots of impasto technique going on here where you can see the brush strokes sort of like filtering through um, the actual color and creating more of an actual texture rather than an implied texture. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a big trait of, of Van Gogh's is to actually allow like the, the paint itself to communicate texture and motion sometimes. Another piece of his, this is the sour. Um, we have a bold, simplified shapes going on, um, flat areas of color being put down, and there's a strength of the tree trunk that balances out the sun. But you can see that really, really thick application of paint here. Creates a lot of new color too. And obviously we have Starry Night. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but we can see here those same characteristics and like the texture of the paint kind of coming through to create this idea of motion. And without that, Starry Night really wouldn't have this sense of motion that it, that it does. Um, if it was just all flattened color and smoothed out and everything, I don't think it would have made as big of an impact on the world as it did. 
um, more personal expressionism. This is not in the style of, of um, Van Gogh, but this is um, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec at the Moulin Rouge. Um, and uh, Lautrec uses a lot of sort of unconventional color to convey his ideas and his thoughts about things. Um, all the skin colors of this, th this group of people are very sort of sickly. And, you know, one could say he's using like the value and maybe like the type of light that's in the, it's in the, the bar in like the, the room with them. Um, but it's, it's really interesting, his choice of color, especially in this space here, it's always sort of haunted me. Um, it's very expressive, unnatural color, heightens the feeling about the people in the world that he painted, which are usually very um, upper class people. So, you know, do what you will with that information. Um, symbolism is another thing that kind of comes from post-impressionism, developed around the 18, 1885. And we see symbolism used in a lot of other artwork as well that's happened throughout history, but the sort of term is coined then. Um, this is when decorative forms and symbols that were intentionally vague or open-ended are conveyed in artworks. Um, Edvard Much, who painted the screen, which I'm sure you've all seen, um, it carried symbolism to expressive intensity. Um, the dominant figure here is called an isolation, fear, and loneliness. Um, and, and we don't really know why they're screaming, like what the, what the situation is. The color is very intense. The figures in the background approaching are lead us to think that they might have something to do with the scream. Um, some people have theorized that the sky is on fire here and it's not just a sunset. Lots of theories here, but it's very open-ended and, and open for interpretation. Now, um, post-impressionism architecture, we see this movement of art nouveau or new art of architecture and interior design. Um, it brought nature into art in new ways and into architecture. Um, Hector Guimard, who is an architect and a designer as well, designed the Castle Baranger, which is the first Parisian art nouveau house. Um, he designed the exterior wallpapers, door handles, carpet, light fixture, but he didn't actually design the actual building itself. He was more of what I guess you would call now like an interior decorator or interior designer. Um, the lobby strongly exploits the motif of organic growth throughout the different railing and different like metal work that we see throughout here. It's really beautiful, um, very organic and sort of mimics like an abstracted plant form. Um, the scheme makes no reference to past styles. This is totally new. I guess you could kind of like reference um, the Rococo style a little bit, but it's it's very different still. And then Art Nouveau carries over to um, like the actual building styles as well. Um, Antony, Antony um, Godi, I think is how you say his last name, creates Casa Mila, which um, the locals call it La Padira or the quarry. Um, Art Nouveau ideas are very apparent in the actual framework itself, this organic form that we see here in the actual like design of the building. Um, he had, we see wildly curving blocks and organically shaped window openings as well, which is very, very difficult to achieve. So um, yeah, this is a great example of Art Nouveau actual like architectural plan. But yeah, um, we will jump back into our last lesson um, and I will see you guys then.